Remember where you were? Pick it up after. Great stuff. Today is the Sunday before Memorial Day. And I know that most folks uh, look at Memorial Day rather as a holiday from work. But I like to challenge us to remember those who have fallen on behalf of freedom. They answered the country's call, went down range, and paid the ultimate price. Pray for their survivors, for their loved ones, friends, families, and of course all those whom we love that have gone on to glory. We're thankful for all of them, and we, we take this opportunity to be mindful of them as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of liberty that comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are reminded of the liberty that our forefathers here in, in America desired to have uh, every citizen to enjoy freedom and liberty, and we know that it comes with a cost. And uh, we are grateful, Father, for our bravest um, for all those who've served. For all those who pay the ultimate price, we're thankful. We're thankful for those even now who are in harm's way, defending freedom. And for those who prepare for such an occasion, we're thankful for them even now. And for those who have in bygone years have put themselves in harm's way to defend freedom, some among us today. We thank you. So even now, Father, we think of Deb and her mom, Pastor, the Bantel family. Um, we lift them up to you and ask for your words of encouragement to their heart. To be found in your word and from the words of those who love them and care for them. That's the encouragement, the full assurance we all crave. We pray that that would be toward one another among us here at Grace. Full assurance, unity, and encouragement. Everything we say today, Father, may it be to give you honor and glory. Nothing else will do. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hymn 471, love found a way. Amen to that. Wonderful love that rescued me, sunk deep in sin, guilty and as I could be. Please stand with me. 471, love found a way. Amen.
Please be seated. By way of announcements, of course we know that Wednesday is our time of prayer and fellowship. We invite you all out at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. And of course on Sundays, borrowing pastor slides here. Uh, we do have Sunday school, 945, for every age under the sun. <laughs> Great stuff. Church cleaning this week, if I have this right, I believe, would be Venables and Gefels. June 29th, again, uh, we're just announcing that there's a church business meeting to vote for new officers and committee members. If you're wondering who they... June 19th. Pardon me, June, June 19th. It's what's up there, right? There we go. June 19th. And if you're wondering what the nominees and what nominations are, they're on the bulletin board. Thanks to all the great work by Grant and the committee. We're thankful for them. And on June 2nd, we do have a dish to pass, as you can see, and it's a cookout. Bring your own meat and dish to pass, right? Sound good? Like cookouts, great stuff. Any other announcements? Am I missing anything? All right, let's move on. Hymn 474, Only a Sinner. I think that includes all of us, huh? Only a Sinner, 474, let's stand together. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4.
Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just uh, ask that your hand be upon this church, Grace Baptist Church, Lord, in uh, our search for a new shepherd. Lord, we just ask that you uh, guide the, the committee to discern um, uh, who the right man and family would be uh, to, to pastor your flock here, Lord. And we just ask that we uh, will just always be a church that uh, unashamedly, Lord, just preaches your gospel message, uh, that souls would be saved here, uh, that the saints would be edified, and that uh, you would ultimately, Lord, be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. How you doing there, Ted? Uh, I'm Gimpy. Gimpy. Gentlemen. Joe, would you have a word of prayer with us, brother? Lord God, we uh, thank you for the time that we uh, come together uh, to praise your holy name. Lord, please use these uh, tithes and offering uh, to further your kingdom. Uh, we praise you for your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Junior Church at this time, we got a surprise for you there, youngins. Go with Uncle Joel. Oh, wahoo. they go. We love them. I invite you to turn to the book of Colossians chapter 2. We'll get through a few verses this week and we'll carry on next Sunday. See what the Lord has in store for us this morning. Colossians chapter 2. Starting at verse 1. I'll wait for you to get there. I'll be using the New King James Version, in case you're wondering. Kind of, uh, if I had to put a title on this, I'd have to say, The Apostles' Struggle in the Concrete of Love. The Apostles' Struggle and the concrete of love. We're going to cover all of that today. And if I haven't said it recently, I love you. Paul says in verse 1, For I want you to know what great a conflict or struggle I have for you 
These are the brethren in Colossae. And those in Laodicea, Laodicea, I'll probably pronounce it both ways today, but. And for as many as not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit, we're going to get on that word pretty good today, knit together in love, we'll be in that word today. And attaining to all riches of the full assurance, we'll be studying that as well, of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures, that word all is important, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And finally, in verse 4, he says, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. So by way of introduction, we have to know that Paul is in chains. He's in prison, a few hundred miles away from Colossae and Laodicea. And while in prison, the Lord has providentially surrounded Paul with some amazing men. These men are spoken of throughout the book of Colossians, and today we will hear about Epaphras. But aside from him, uh, if you were in the study uh, with us in the adult class earlier in the year, we found Onesimus. If he's not familiar to you, read the book of Philemon. <laughs> so he was in prison with Paul. And we have Tychicus. I'll refer to him a little later as Paul's postman. Because he ultimately is the one who takes this most precious letter and delivers it to the people at Colossae. In chapter 4, verse 12, we find that Paul mentions Epaphras. Now why is this important? It's important because the word of laboring there, as we read this, it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bond servant of Christ, greets you, always laboring. That word laboring is the same word that we found in verse 1. When Paul was alluding to the conflict or the laboring, the struggle that he has. And we'll, we'll, get, to, we'll get into that in pretty good detail, what, it, what that really is. And why it's important that he wants the people at Colossae to know why he's struggling. It's not so much that he's telling them that he is, he wants them to know why. This is why I'm struggling, and this is what I want you to know. But Epaphras is also struggling. He's, he's laboring fervently for you in prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that spells out spiritual warfare there. There's, there's the conflict taking place that's not just in this physical realm. We'll get to that. And his desire, Epaphras, is, is in full alignment with Paul that you may stand perfect and complete that word complete there also means to be fully assured, to have confidence. In what? All, there's that word all again, <laughs> all the will of God. So Paul is, is expressing in this epistle, this letter of love to the people at Colossae, I'm dealing with some serious issues here, and I want you to know about it. And it's because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, do we? We wrestle against principalities and powers found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in heavenly places. 
the warfare that was being raged and waged against the people at Colossae was of great concern to Paul. Because quite honestly, there was very little he could do about it. He was in chains in prison. A great distance away. But yet, he had the parchment, not quite the bic, but he wrote a letter. And I believe that Paul's struggle was to ensure that whatever the Lord had him to convey to these sweet, beloved people would be the right news, the right instruction, the right warnings. That all proceeds that through Paul, through his hand, to the letter, would be all of the Lord and none of Paul. And hence the authenticity of his epistles. Because as Paul goes on to say in verse 4 of chapter 2, Now this, I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. There's a battle raging through philosophy and deceit that's coming upon the church of Colossae. And Paul is really concerned about it. And he affirms that he has not met them face to face. So I have to believe that even from his stating that, that there are those who would even question Paul's apostolic authority because they never met him. That even he himself was under attack by those within and those outside of the church at Colossae and Laodicea. The struggle is a spiritual one for sure. But now here's this love letter. Colossians 2 verse 8 has an additional warning to the beloved. Beware. That gets your attention. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. Boy, that encapsulates an awful lot, doesn't it, as far as the Christian's concerned? Because he finishes it by saying, and not according to Christ. It's a pretty significant limitation as to what we should base our lives on. And that's why we at Grace put all of our stock in the Word of God. And in the proper uh, instruction that comes from the Word of God. So that no outside influence, no philosophies, no matter how, how innocent they may seem, whatever their sources may be, if they are not of Christ, it's deceit. It's not profitable. And the reason for that is, is in verse 3, Paul says, In whom are hidden all, and there is the word all, I said I would touch on it, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So my question to you would be, where else would you go? We don't, there's nowhere else to go. There's no other authority other than in Christ. Amen. That should be our fulfillment we don't have need of outside philosophy or even other religious attempts at righteousness, thought, or wisdom. He says it's persuasive and it's deceptive. And it is. But we are to cling to the treasures and wisdom and the knowledge that is in Christ our Savior. We have no need of anything else in our Christian existence. We don't. Paul is concerned about the confidence. The, that word full assurance there. Full assurance. You know, that's, that's to be confident. Paul wants the people he desires, he passionately seeks to entreat 
the beautiful saints, the beloved, that they would attain to all the riches of the full assurance of understanding. To the knowledge of the mystery of God, of the Father, and of Christ. And why is that important? Because in verse 3 it goes on to say, In whom are hidden, again, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Folks, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit at our rebirth. He's promised. You've got it. You've got Him. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have that knowledge. We have that wisdom. Otherwise, it's hidden from the world. Now, really, what is the, the necessity of Paul's letter? And I believe that his motivation, again, is that the people at Colossae who were under attack, that they would be fully assured. That they would find encouragement. Hmm. <laughs> Don't we as believers often desire a greater assurance in what we believe? We do. How many among us have not experienced discouragement, depression, trepidations, or even had their faith waver? Yeah, I think we have. But we crave encouragement. We crave it. If you didn't, you wouldn't be here today because where, where else are you going to find that encouragement? Anything you find in the world is going to be here today, gone tomorrow. What you achieve here in the, in the fellowship of believers is everlasting. Amen. And it strengthens you. It brings you through the circumstances of life. That's why we gather together to encourage one another by the word of God. So what motivates Paul? What motivates him? I want to go back to the verse where Paul alludes in verse 2 to the word knit. Knit. Do you think it's any, not by any accident that Paul knows about knitting? What did he use to make? Tents. tents. <laughs> if you've been in a tent, you know what a good seal means, right? <laughs> yeah, it keeps the weather out, keeps the bugs out. But knitting is, is it, to me, it ta has taken on a new meaning since Beth has had surgery. To me, the knitting is like that suture where two parts of the flesh have been severed. And now there's been a device, a, a cat gut, or I don't know what they use today to bring the, the flesh together and then tie a knot and hold it that, that way, right? And the purpose of that is twofold. Is to keep from what's inside from getting out, right? Sometimes you just want to keep some of the unpleasantness within, and we're going to get to love in a moment because that's where this is going, and it also keeps that which offends from gaining entrance. So you see, I like the word knit because to me it's like being sutured. And I'm going to refer to being sutured as we discuss love in a minute because I believe that's what love does. It takes open wounds and it brings them together. It closes them. It leaves what's nasty maybe underneath, and keeps it below, and it also keeps what affronts from gaining access. That's what love does. And Paul is driven by this incredible love. I got to believe it rages in his heart because it's the love of Christ. It's the love of Christ, and I would say that this love is also a bond. 
Colossians 3.14. Just turn there briefly with me. Because he uses the word bond. But above all these things put on love. Wow. Which is the bond, I'm going to call it cement, of perfection. Some may argue I'm being a, a little bit traumatic, a little bit metaphorical. No. Paul chose the word bond for a reason. Because that's what love does. It bonds us together like cement. Cement is supposed to resist the elements, hold up bridges, hold back mighty rivers. Cement. But cement left to its own devices will also break down as Grant has a career, you know, based on pointing that out to folks. The cement is dying, it's broken down, this bridge needs to be reset. But when it's in the right place and it's well cared for, it does its job. And you don't even think about it while you're driving over. Cement. Well, what is it as far as love goes? In 1 Corinthians 13, this is a very familiar passage to us. You can, you can turn there. But in this great passage that Paul had penned to the church at Corinth, he goes down through the list quite um, systematically, in my opinion, to outline the ingredients of what makes love so impenetrable. And I would suggest to you that the ingredients to this cement that binds us together is patience. Yeah. Kindness. The love that cements us together is never envious. That's not love. The love that binds us and cements us together never boasts at the expense of others. And it doesn't break the rules of propriety. It's never unseemly. Amen. And you know, this love, the ingredient is that it isn't selfish. <laughs> and it's not easily irritated like an open wound. Love sutures the wound and vanquishes that irritation. And finally, love does not keep a record of wrong. That's gorilla glue, man. That is gorilla glue. Love rejoices in the truth because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the antithesis of concrete would be a jackhammer. Right? I mean, once it's laid down, you need something greater than the force that holds it together to break it apart. It takes some effort to really break the bonds of love. It really does. And the enemy seeks to destroy, as he has to the people at Corinth and Laodicea, the enemy seeks to destroy from within with everything that is the antithesis of the love we just described. And you know what that looks like and can look like. If the enemy can undermine love that we have toward one another, people, he gains a foothold. all I'm saying. He knows the strength of love in Christ. He knows. It's formidable to our enemy. But he will waste no energy, no effort to seek to undermine it. That's what Satan does. 
and he was using the, the open and the filthy and the deceitful philosophies and arguments in Colossae to affect that kind of destruction. And Paul's concerned about it. At the root of this kind of love, we find a word that we often hear, and it's called unity. It's oftentimes used in a secular sense to bring corporations and teams that work together, blah, blah, blah. Not so here amongst the brethren. Unity has a special meaning. Because we will be united in glory without anything in between. Until such time we, we engage together in love toward one another, preferring one another greater than ourselves, so that we can find unity. Romans 12, 16. Why don't you turn there? Romans 12, 16. Romans 12, 16 says, Be of the same mind. Toward hmm, one another. Now this mind I would suggest to you is the mind of Christ. Because in and of our human minds we're selfish by nature. Lest the Lord acts upon us to change the way we behave toward one another. We're, we're naturally selfish. We care for ourselves. But not so with the believers. No, no. Paul's saying be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. And do not be wise in your own opinion. Lord, remind me of that always. Paul loves this church, people. Colossae and Laodicea. He loves them. And I have to ask if, we're, if we are willing in the, as individuals to invest in loving the beloved. Are you willing to take the risk to suit up, to wrestle, to be in conflict spiritually, going to war in that sense on behalf of the beloved? Are we wrestling for the brethren or do we find that we're wrestling with the brethren. I won't ask that again. I think it's clear. God would have us wrestling for one another. I'd encourage you to take a peek at all the great things the brethren that you're sitting with and will commune with following the service, take into consideration the wonderful things they bring into your life. And I trust that you will find the full assurance that is yours, it's guaranteed. You'll find them in the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge of the Father and of His Son. And that's what binds us together here, there, or in the air. Amen? Let's pray. We do pray, Father, for revival in our hearts and each one of us. A re-emerging of the flame that burns within us to be more like you and less like ourselves. Give us this bond of love that can't be prevailed upon regardless of the circumstances 
we face. And any open wounds, Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you would suture them, touch them, heal them. Let love prevail above all things. That in so doing, you would receive all the glory, all the praise, all the thanks. For we are empty without you, and we're empty without one another. Be careful to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd ask you to turn to Him 485. Continue to light that fire. Uh, it's so easily extinguished Amen. by this world. Uh, uh, it's it's smothered by the things of this world and, and by our own laziness Amen. and slothfulness and conflict, Lord. But we ask that you light that fire again. Uh, may it blaze for your glory, as it says, thine be the glory. Um, and so, Father, just uh, again, may your love, the love of Christ, uh, illuminate, enlighten our hearts that you would be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.